verse 25, this is what it says. A woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she had been saying to herself, if I can just touch his garment, if I can just get close to him, if I can, if I can just be near him, I will get well. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Verse 30, it says, and immediately Jesus perceiving in himself that power from him had gone out, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you? And yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be cured of your disease. Father, I pray we would receive this word today. Hallelujah. I pray we would receive it, that your name would receive the glory from it. And it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Before you're seated, say, say to the next door neighbor, whoever, right? Next door neighbor, praise God. The person sitting beside you, press into him. Press into him. Come on. Man, well, I hope you all are good. This morning, I hope that you realize that this is a day that the Lord has made so that you can rejoice and be glad in it no matter what's happening around you. I think that's, that's really important uh, to understand because, man, life has a funny way of beating us up and, and really trying to get us down. But if we can realize, no, wait a minute, this is a day that the Lord has made. And here's the truth. Sometimes in life, man... The only thing I can do is rejoice that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life because life has beaten me up so badly and things are coming against me that I have to remember, no, wait a minute, I'm rejoicing not because everything in my life is good, but because the God I serve is good and my name is written in heaven with him. And so, man, I can rejoice in that fact and be exceedingly glad even though this world is trying to persecute me and do all kinds of manner evil against me, but man... Sometimes that's what we got to have. Amen. Amen. I hope you guys came ready to press into Jesus. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Amen. Well, I believe I have a word for you today. But before we hop into it, let me, just, let me just say this. If you haven't taken the opportunity to sign up to help with the carnival, come on, somebody. Man, do so. <clears throat> yeah, do so. Because uh, we need your help. We need your help to be able to, to pull it off. And it's a great opportunity, listen, to, to be able to come alongside your church family and get to know one another and connect with people in your church family. And so, man, I hope you take that opportunity. Another thing that it's, it's really good at is it, it, it causes us to, to serve the families in our communities, which, by the way, is biblical, just so you know. So the Bible says to serve and not just be served, that the greatest among you will be the greatest servant among you. And so it's a great opportunity to be obedient to the word of God by coming and giving up some of your time to be able to, to be a part of sharing the gospel um, with those that, that live in our community. So stop by Connect Central on your way out uh, and, and sign up. Because here's the thing, we only got two weeks. It's two weeks away. The carnival is two weeks away. We'll have a few thousand people descend upon us and we'll get to minister the gospel to them two weeks from now. And, and, and here's, the, here's the truth, man. We need about 75 more people to, to help pull this thing off well. And so I hope you are one of the 75 people. I'll tell you what, look at your neighbor and, I, and, and point at him. Say, I want you to be one of the 75. <clears throat> Husbands, I give you the permission to point at your wife. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, that's not going to help you, actually. Amen. So listen, last week we, we did a message. We went through a message titled, Go After Him. 
right? Go after him. The him obviously being Jesus. If you can't tell, we're trying to send a message that it's all about Jesus. It's on our shirts. It's on the wall. Like it's everywhere you look because we're trying to not even subtly send the message. We're just right in your face with it. Like life is all about Jesus. And so last, last week we talked about going after Jesus. And I really believe that the Lord made it very, very clear to us. It was very straightforward um, that, he, that he spoke spoke to us and what he was telling us is what he requires from us because there are things that he requires from us if we desire to go after him if we desire to give our lives to him then there's things he requires from you and from me and here's the thing man we don't set that agenda we don't tell god how we're willing to follow him he tells us how we have to follow him amen Amen. And what I've found in life is oftentimes how we think we should go after God doesn't line up with the way God says we have to go after him. And so last week, that's what we talked about, what God requires of us if we want to pursue him and give our lives to him. And this week, if I had to title the message, I would title it, Press Into Him. Press Into Him. And here's the thing, right? Going after him and pressing into him aren't always one and the same. They don't always look the same. Oftentimes they look a lot different. You know, there's, there's people all across the world, especially in America right now, who have gathered into churches. And, and they would say, they would say, I'm, I'm, I'm going after Jesus just because they are in church, but they aren't pressing into Jesus. They didn't come into the house of God desperate to get close to the Son of God. They aren't worshiping God. They aren't praying and inviting God into their life to take over their situation. And again, I'll remind you this week, like I did last week, when Jesus shows up, he shows up to take over. He doesn't show up to partner with you. It's not like he's like, hey, I need some advice on how to live this life and help you live the life. No, no, no. He shows up to take over your life and every aspect of your life. That's who he is because he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And there are people who aren't praying and inviting him to come in and take, take over. There are people who aren't pressing into the word of God, gleaning from God's, from God's word. And they think by just simply coming to church that it's enough, that that's enough, man. I'm, I'm going after him and I'm pressing into him because I'm in, in church. They think that just reading their daily bread five minutes in the morning is enough. Like that's, that's plenty the truth is, there's a lot of people who fill churches week in and week out, but they aren't pressing in to Jesus. And it's a sad, sad reality. And can I be really honest with you for a moment? There's also people on the platforms preaching Jesus who aren't pressing into Jesus either. I mean, they're up here saying it, but they aren't living it. They aren't, they aren't doing it. Listen to me, if we want to be a people who continually go after Jesus, we got to be a people who continually press in to Jesus. And I'm telling you, man, if we could figure this out as a people, if we could get this through our thick heads, man, our lives would be forever changed. Forever changed. That literally everything is found in him. There's nothing we need outside of him. If we could figure this out, out the things that that try to bind us and these things that that tempt us will no longer have a hold on us they just won't those things that the doctors have actually came to us and told us nah there's no healing of that that's just it is what it is you just got to accept how you're those things will be healed in jesus name they will be they are healed in jesus name amen the bible says that by his stripes we are healed hallelujah if we can just figure out how to press into him and touch him. We'll receive our healing. We'll receive our freedom. We'll receive our victory because that's what the Bible teaches us. Man, we gotta be a people who get desperate so that we'll press into him. And in this story found in Mark chapter five, starting in verse 25, it's a great illustration of exactly that, of someone pressing in to Jesus. Now, in this text, right, we, we find a woman who is, who is dealing with an issue, with a condition, and she's been dealing with this condition for many years, for, for 12 years is what the Bible says. So that tells us that for over a decade, 
This woman has been plagued by this condition. She woke up with this condition. She went to bed with this condition. This condition followed her wherever she went. She couldn't get rid of this condition. And because she had this condition for so long, for such a long period of time, she is now being defined and labeled by her condition. She's not even given a name in the scriptures. It's not like, oh, Rebecca was dealing with this condition or Sarah was having trouble with this problem. No, no, no. It just simply says the woman with the issue of blood doesn't even name her. Has defined her by her condition, which I believe is very significant and we shouldn't over, overlook it because so often the world wants to define us by the things that bind us. The world wants to define us by the things that try to keep us from fulfilling what God has called us to do. That's what the world does. It tries to label us by the conditions that plague our lives. And you know, I gotta admit, man, I can really relate to this story of the woman with the issue of blood. Not the woman part and the bleeding part, but that would be weird. But I can relate. <laughs> I can relate on several different facets though to this story really, really well. It's impacted my life greatly. I can relate because, man, before I gave my life to Jesus, before I met Jesus, man, I was plagued and defined by my condition. A lot of you know my, my, my story and my testimony, right? I come from a long, long line of drug addicts and I was a drug addict for many years, over 15 years this addiction, this condition followed me wherever I, go, wherever I went. I would go to sleep with it. I'd wake up with it. And I had it for so long. And because of that, people started to define me by it. This is literally what they, they, they known me for. Like, like that's Keith and he's an addict. I was labeled constantly because of my addiction. And you know, I, I can even remember this, man. People would tell me you were born a drug addict. Because, you know, my family tree, my, my, my dad and my dad's dad and his dad's dad, right, come from a long list of people who struggle with alcoholism and addiction. And so people would say, yeah, yeah, you were born an addict and you'll probably die an addict. This is what they would, this is what they would say to me. And I'm telling you, this condition I had, this addiction separated me and segregated me, isolated me from society on multiple different occasions. And the world was trying to label me this. They were trying to define me with it by the things that I struggled with. The world wants to try to label us by the things that are trying to keep us from fulfilling what God has called us to do. But how many of you realize this, that God doesn't label us or define us by the things that we struggle with? He just doesn't. Listen to me, if we actually had a label on us, you know, like our shirts do, you know how they say made in China or whatever, or made in USA. Like if we had a label on us, it wouldn't even say made in the USA. It would say we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It would tell you this. It would say that you have, you have been created in the image and likeness of the Father. That that's what the Bible says. This is how the Bible labels us and defines us. See, the world doesn't get to define what the world did not create period. Your parents don't even get to define you. Your past doesn't have to define you. God is the one that gets to define you and nobody else. God does. But the world, man, it tried so hard to define me. And, and, and to be honest with you, man, I really started to believe what the world was saying about me. I really did, because after years and years and years of it, just like this woman, I tried everything, man. Spent so much money wanting help, trying to get fixed, trying to figure this out, to stop doing these drugs and stop this thing that had literally plagued my life so bad. I had nothing, I, I didn't have anything. And man, I was so sick of it. But no matter what I did, I couldn't, I couldn't get off of it. And so man, as they kept telling me this, that man, you're a drug addict, you'll always be a drug addict. I actually started to believe it. And I remember at one point in time in my life, I actually thought this, I thought, you know what, I'll never see my 30s. I'll never, to make, I'll never make it to see my 30s. How awful is that as a 22 year old young man? So it doesn't really matter what I do because I'm not gonna see my 30s anyway. 
until I met Jesus. And then Jesus said, no, 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 you're free. And who the son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Amen. And see, the, the world can no longer define me by the thing that used to, used to have a hold of me. Do you know why? Because the Bible says that old things have passed away and behold, all things have become brand new. That the old man is, is dead and gone and the new man is here to stay. And so I'm no longer defined by my condition that once plagued my life. And see, in this story in, in Mark chapter 5, right, this woman had been defined by her condition. The woman with the issue of blood, that's what it says about her. Now, something you have to realize in the story, if you do a little digging, a little bit of research, and you, and you begin to, to, to do references in the Bible, you'll, you'll find that in Leviticus chapter 15, it tells you the significance of this. And here's the significance of this. In Leviticus 15, the Bible says this, that a woman with this type of condition, a woman who was bleeding past her menstrual cycle, is literally what it says, she would be considered unclean. Unclean. And so because she was unclean, she had to be separated and isolated from society, from her family, from all those people who loved her and she loved and who cared about her. She had to be separated from them. Because whoever came in contact with her, even if she would go to the supermarket and brush against somebody, not even on purpose, that person was considered now unclean. If she walked up to shake your hand, now you were unclean. If you walked up to say hello and pat her on the shoulder, now you're unclean. And that made everybody who came in contact with her also unclean. And so they had to isolate and separate from society as well. And so here this woman is having to live every day with this awful condition and she had to do it all alone without her loved ones, without the people who cared about her and she cared about them. Could you imagine how awful this would be? Not only having to live with this life-threatening condition because don't get it twisted, you can only bleed for so long until the blood runs out of your body and then your body seizes up and you die. So not only does she have to live with that reality and have to face that every single day, she has to do it all by herself. Separated from society, separated from her family, separated from her church family. No one around her to encourage her. And let me tell you what I know about the enemy. I will guarantee you the enemy was lying to her every single day because that's what he does. That's his native tongue. When he speaks, Jesus says he's been a liar and a murderer from the beginning, and that's his native tongue. When he speaks, he's lying. And this is what I know the enemy does. Tries to isolate us and then begin to lie to us. He wants to separate us from a God who loves us and from people who care about us. He wants to do that. Because if he can get us alone, if he can separate us from the herd, from the pack, man, he can beat us up and he can take us out. He can get us to start to believe all those lies that he's speaking to you if you're isolated. He wants us to think that, that we're all alone in this, in this thing called life, that we are the only ones dealing with the hard things that we're dealing with. He wants us to believe that we're the only ones struggling the way we are are struggling, that we're the only ones that's ever went through what we are going through at that very time. But I'm here to tell you today, that's a lie from the pit of hell, that you're not alone, that you're not alone. And listen to me, somebody, somebody actually needs to hear this today. I felt the power of the Holy Spirit when I, was, when I was preparing this message, that somebody needs to hear this today, that you're not alone. And what you're dealing with, the hard thing that you're dealing with, someone else has struggled through it too. Someone else has went through it. And listen, maybe the thing you're dealing with is an addiction, whether it's alcoholism or, or drugs or pornography or lust or, or whatever the case may be. I felt like the Lord wanted to, to say to you today, you're not alone. You're not alone. Listen, the Bible is clear. It says this, that no temptation has overtaken you such as common to man. 
but God is faithful and will provide a way of escape. Simply saying this, that all of us are going through something. Every single, and the thing that you're going through, someone else has already been through it or they're going through it right now. And I tell you, when you run into people who say they're not going through nothing, well, then they're liars and now they're going through being a liar. So <laughs> I'm just... So it just all works full circle right back around, I promise. We're all dealing with something in life, I promise you. And guess what? We all need Jesus to deliver us from our struggles. All of us. All of us need him to set us free from those things. None of us can get through them on our own. We're not meant to try to walk this life alone. Life is better done together. See, we need Jesus to walk us through it and to set us free from it and to heal us in the midst of it. But we also need people around us that will encourage us, that will strengthen us, that will help us, but that will also hold us accountable. Amen. Amen. Man, but the enemy doesn't want us to know that. He wants you to think you're on an island all by yourself. But we cannot afford to allow him to isolate us from a God who loves us and from a people who care about us. Come on, tell your neighbor you're not alone. Tell him. Say you're not alone. You know, something else I find really interesting about this, this woman's condition is this. She's bleeding on the inside. She, she's dying on the inside. Meaning, meaning simply this. If you met her on the streets, you would have no idea what she's going through. You would have no clue about her bleeding on the inside. You have no idea about her, her condition because everything she's struggling with is internal. It's all internal. See, so often people are struggling with things that no one else can see. No one else can see. Sometimes that's an addiction. Other times it's depression and anxiety. It's fear, it's doubt, it's hopelessness, it's insecurities, you, you name it. And people actually, they, they try to mask it. We, we try to mask it. We try to put on a good face. I always say this, that people come into church and they put on their Jesus face, like everything's all good. Knowing doggone well, it ain't no good. I'm not sure if it's a good word to say from the pulpit or not, but I just did. I don't think it's bad. Lord, forgive me if it was. <clears throat> but they really do, man. People put on their, their, their Jesus face in hopes to, to hide what they're dealing with and what they're going through. Try to make everybody think that they got it all together, that everything in their life is just hunky-dory, right? But they're bleeding on the inside. They're dying on the inside. And they're losing their faith with every passing moment. And because we can't see it, we don't even know that it's happening. And I bet you we could, we could go around this room, which we will not do, by the way, <laughs> we won't do that. I won't do it to you. <clears throat> but we could go around this room right now and there's people right now in that, in that circumstance right now who are dealing with this very thing, who are trying to cover up their bleeding, who are trying to cover up the fact that on the inside they're dying and they're not sure how to get out of it. People will come in and their marriages are in shambles but will put on a face like everything is okay in my marriage when they're on the brink of divorce. This happens constantly. And, and hear me, if you're, if, you're here, if you're here today, man, and this is what you're dealing with in your life right now, I want you to know that even though, even though we cannot see it, God sees it. God sees every broken place. He says, he sees every place that you're bleeding on the inside, every place that you're hurting, all the pain and the suffering that you're dealing with that nobody else can see, he sees it and he wants to heal you from it. He wants to set you free from it. I'm telling you, God wants to restore every broken thing in your life. He wants to reconcile every broken marriage that the enemy has tried to steal, kill, and destroy. And what this shows us, this story, that is if, if we can press into Jesus, if we could just, 
if we can just get to Jesus and touch Jesus, that Jesus will turn what the enemy meant for harm for your good, I promise you, because the Bible says it. And I'm telling you, I'm not just saying it because it sounds good to say. I'm saying it because I serve a God who is good. I'm saying it because I believe it with every fiber of my being because I've, I've experienced the goodness of God in the land of the living. I've walked it and seen God do it in my life time and time again. And I know this, that if, man, if we can just have one touch from him, just one, our lives will never be the same. Everything will change in our lives. If we can just press in and push past all the distractions of this life. This woman has this, this issue, this issue of blood. And not only has she been dealing with this issue for a very, very long time, and not only has she had to do it all alone, separated from society and isolated from her family, but also it's cost her everything she owned. Literally everything that she owned. And this is what it says in verse 26 of Mark chapter 5. It says, she had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. Hmm. Not only couldn't they help her, they made her worse. See, see, listen to me. The world cannot offer you what they cannot give you. That's actually really, really good. The world cannot offer you what they don't have to give you. This woman was so sick and tired of being sick and tired. She was so sick of all of it that she spent everything she had to try to get over it, try to get through it, visited as many doctors as she possibly could. She had the greatest and the latest that modern medicine could have to offer her. She went to all the best doctors. She did all the best treatments. She tried all the brand new drugs, did all the latest surgeries, but nothing helped her. It actually made her worse. And so I started thinking, I wonder how many times have we done this very thing in our own struggles? How many times have we done this very thing when we're struggling in this life? How many times have we went running to the world looking for answers instead of getting desperate for Jesus and pressing into him and having him touch us? How many times? I've seen on multiple occasions people struggling with depression and they come in and, and talk and, and all those different things and, and, and I think that's good. But a lot of times what I see is instead of pressing into Jesus to heal them from the depression, they go and get a pill from a doctor wanting a quick and easy fix, a momentary release. And listen, I'm not talking about nobody. I've done this kind of stuff myself in my life. There's been times in my life where I've, I've struggled so bad with depression and anxiety. The anxiety would become so, so overwhelming. And I'm not just saying my heart beating fast and me getting sweats, like where I will literally pass out on the ground. Boom, on the ground, wake up, like what in the world just happened? My wife's saying, you all right? You all right in front of all these people at the airports and on airplanes? And it's happened several times. And that those times in my life, what I did was, instead of pressing into Jesus and believing Jesus for my healing, I went to get a quick fix from a doctor and saw many doctors. How do I, how do I just, I just want to take a pill and get over it and get on with my life. I want the easy way out of it. But you know what I found every time I did that? And every time someone else did that, they ended up worse off than they did before. They ended up worse off. I ended up worse off even than I did when I had the anxiety attacks. Man, we got to stop taking the easy way out. And instead, we got to be a people who are pressing in and being desperate for a touch from Jesus. Because hear me, listen to me. Only Jesus can do Jesus stuff. He's the only one. He's the only one. Jesus is the only one that can heal you. Jesus is the only one that can sustain you. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy you. Jesus is the only one that can set you free. Whatever you need free from, he's the only one. See, the world 
cannot offer you what they cannot give you. They can't take your depression from you. They can't. They can offer you a counterfeit to mask it for a little bit. They can't take your anxiety from you. They can't take the, they, they, they can't take the addiction from you. They can't. Only Jesus can do these things. See, this woman's condition got worse and worse and worse because she ran to the world looking for answers when she should have been desperate for Jesus, pressing into him and trusting him to heal her. Her condition got worse and we'll be no different. We'll be no different. Verse 27 through 29 says this, after hearing about Jesus, now all of a sudden she, she hears about Jesus. And she came up in the crowd from behind him and touched his cloak. For she had been saying to herself, if I can, if I can just touch his, his garment, if I just get desperate enough to press into him, I'll get well. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her own body that she was healed of her disease. This woman became so desperate, so desperate to touch Jesus. She, she was so desperate that she, she pressed into him even when the crowds were all around him. Even when she wasn't even supposed to be out of isolation, she just didn't even care. I'm going after him and there ain't nobody stopping me. No one's getting in my way. And with just one touch, just one, one touch from Jesus did for her what several doctors from the world couldn't do for her. Just one touch. One touch from Jesus did for her what all the money in the world she had couldn't do for her. Because with Jesus, it only takes one touch, just one. Just one. The doctors will try many different things to try to help you with depression and anxiety and all these things. You'll jump from pill to pill to pill till they figure it out. But one touch from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and immediately you'll be healed. See church, we gotta, we, we gotta get desperate for him so that we will be a people that press into him. We've gotta stop running to the world looking for answers and asking for help and start pressing into Jesus no matter what. And if we're dealing with a struggle in our lives, and, and I don't even, it doesn't even matter what the struggle is. It doesn't matter if it's an addiction or if it's anxiety or, or if, it's just, if it's hurts and pains. Man, if we, can, if we can get through our minds and if we, if we can just touch him, if we would resolve in our hearts, come hell or high water, I don't care what the crowd says. I don't care what people label me. I, I, don't, I don't really give a rip what people think about my condition. I mean, I'm, I'm going after him. I'm not gonna stop praying. I'm not gonna stop worshiping. I'm not gonna stop opening up this word and getting into the word of God until I can feel that I'm healed. And we can declare to the Lord, Lord, I'm telling you, I'm gonna stay on my knees. I'm gonna keep pressing into you until I feel my bleeding stop on the inside, until I know I'm no longer dying on the inside. Lord, I'm not gonna let you rest and I'm not gonna rest until I receive it. Until I receive my healing, until my marriage is completely restored, until my son or my daughter is completely set free. God, I'm gonna keep pressing until you answer, until you show up. I'm gonna keep going after you. And I don't care what the world says. I don't care what they've labeled me as. I'm just busy pressing because I'm desperate for my healing. Church, we gotta start being a people who are desperate for him. Not a people who are laissez-faire and just say, hey, we're gonna go to church because it sounds fun. Just say Jesus because he's nice. No, no, no. Desperate for a touch from God. And if we do that, then our lives and the lives of those around us will be changed forever. Forever. And it only takes one touch, just one. Verse 30 through 34 says this, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power from him had gone out, he turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said, said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you 
And you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be cured of all your disease. Now, now you, you have to get this, this picture, and I'm, and I'm closing right here in a moment. Are you guys still with me? I must be preaching good. You're really quiet. I'll just tell myself that anyway. <clears throat> But you have to get this, you gotta get this picture of what's happening because this is not just some good story. This actually happened. Like this actually took place in real life and in real time, this right here. And it's an amazing story. It's amazing. Jesus is actually headed to heal a little girl who's dying. That's where he's headed to. That's the backstory. The backstory is, remember last week, the demoniac, Jesus heals him. The people don't want him in the region. He gets back into the boat, goes back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Upon arriving at the Sea of Galilee, he gets out the boat. He's met by Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. And he's like, Jesus, I know you can heal her. Just come with me. My little girl is dying. My little girl, she's getting ready to die. But if you come, if you come, she'll be healed. And so Jesus is on his way to go heal this little girl. And on his way, this huge crowd starts to gather around him. This huge crowd starts to press in all around him. But I find it interesting that they're pressing in all around him, but they're not pressing in to him. I mean, they are following him in hopes to get something from him, in hopes to see him perform a miracle right in front of them. They're just just following him. And this scene, I think sometimes we think like it's just real nice and neat and orderly. Like the people are just, hey, Jesus, how are you? You know, they're just kind of walking in a single file line. No, 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 it's a mob, it's mayhem, it's chaotic. The savior of the world has now just touched down on the earth and he's healing every sick person. And every demon is coming and they're fleeing like crazy. And so all these people are just pressing him and they're mobbing him. They're clutching him. They're pulling on him. And his disciples, you have to picture that they are trying to keep the people back. Stop it. Let him breathe. They can't even, they can't even see in front of them of where they're heading because of all the thousands of people all around them. They're just trying to keep the people from crushing Jesus and they're pushing them back saying, calm down, get out of the way. We're headed to heal a little girl, knock it off. But yet the crowd gets louder and more chaotic and they continue to press in. More people keep coming and Jesus stops dead in his tracks with all these thousands of people around him, turns around and says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, what are you talking about right now? everybody's touching you. I mean, dude, we're trying to save your life because they're going to press you, like they're going to smash you. What are you, what are you even, what are you even talking about, Jesus? And he ignores all of that and he turns around and starts looking for the woman who had done this. And right there and then is where the Lord started to stir this message in my heart several weeks ago when I was on vacation. I was just reading it in my personal devotion time. And the Lord said to me right then, he said, there is a way that you can press into me and your pressing will cause me to look for you. And man, this blew my mind. The Lord was like, listen, the way you press into me will get my attention focused on you. Even though there are thousands and millions of people praying to me, prodding me, asking me for all kinds of things, but your pressing can cause me to look for you in the midst of the crowd, in the midst of the chaos. There's a way we can press, press into him to cause him to shift his focus to us if we do that then the Lord says I'll heal you I'll heal you I'll strengthen you I'll set you free I'll reconcile back to you everything the enemy has stolen from you but first you have to press into me and I don't know about any of you but it did it blew my mind I was so excited when I got this word that the way that to think the way that I press into the king of kings and the lord of lords can cause him to look for me 
the way that I press into the one who, who by the spin, splendor of his very breath spoke the world into existence and in, then into to motion, he says this. He says, if you press into me, I will look for you. You know what I find to be amazing? That when we press into him, we'll see he's always been looking for us. That's what's beautiful. If you press into him and you're desperate for him, you'll get his attention. You'll get his attention. This story of the woman with the issue of blood is such an amazing truth. It's such an amazing truth. And yes, I said it's, it's, it's truth because I believe that 100% of this book is true. That there's not one thing in it that is false. Because hear me, it, it's, it's either the word of God, a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path, or there's part of the stories that aren't true. And if that's true, it means that the whole Bible's not true. If Jesus isn't exactly who he says he is, it, it, it kills me when people say, well, I think Jesus was a good man, but not the son of God. No, no, no. Either Jesus was the son of God or he was the biggest fraud to ever live. You can't have it both ways. Like some of the Bible I believe, other parts of the Bible I don't. I'm sorry, it, it, you don't have that luxury. Either you believe it all or you believe none of it. And I choose to believe it's 100% true that God inspired man to write this by the power of the Holy Spirit and that every comma, every apostrophe is perfect. Every story in it is for us to glean from and to learn from so that we can learn to press in to the Son of the Most High God so that then he will make us whole and make us complete, that he will heal every broken place in our lives. See this this woman with the issue of blood, it's, it's amazing because she was a woman who was once defined by her condition, but now she's defined by her healer. I love it. This woman who, who once was, was broken in so many areas of her life has now been completely made whole with just one touch, just one. It wasn't like she had to follow Jesus for a long time. It was one moment and one touch with the king and everything in her life changed. This woman searched the entire world and all the smartest doctors in it. And one moment with him, one touch from him, did for her what the world could not do for her. Telling us all we need is one, just one touch, just one. And everything in our lives, everything in our lives, the hurt, the pain, the brokenness, all of it, all of it will be healed immediately come on and stand to your feet please every head bowed every eye closed please Lord you see every person here see every heart in this place you see all the brokenness in this place and within us you see the brokenness father and father I pray right now that by the unction of the Holy Spirit that God we would begin to press in to your son Jesus with everything that is within us Spirit, Lord, that you would begin to move on the hearts of men and women in this place. Those who are bound by addictions, bound by insecurities, bound by infirmities. Father, I pray that they would push past all of that to come after you, Jesus. And I pray that you would begin to set a fire deep in our souls. That nothing will stop us from coming after you, Jesus. That we won't settle for what the world has to offer. The counterfeit things that the world has to offer. We won't settle for those things, but that we will come to you, Jesus. Knowing that just one touch from you. Just one touch be made brand new 
Lord, I lift up every marriage in this house. I pray reconciliation by the power of the Holy Ghost. Right now, Father, I pray that. We declare your goodness over each and every marriage. We pray that you are the third strand that would bind them together, oh God. And we bind the enemy. We bind him right now. Thank you that you're all we need, that you are the one-stop shop, that we ain't got to go to a other bunch of different other things or people. We can come to you and receive everything that we need. I pray we each have a revelation of that today. Reveal that to us today, Father, and give us the desire and the hunger to come after you, Lord, with everything that is within us. Jesus' mighty name.